Growing up, law enforcement are writing tickets, so why take the risk? Do the smart thing and start buckling up every trip, day or night. Click it or ticket. A message brought to you by NHTSA. Are you ready to kick off summer? So are we. Come to the official Memorial Day weekend rooftop opening party at City Tap in downtown Nashville on Sunday, May 30th. All the excitement starts at 3 p.m. featuring the refreshing Yazoo Kella IPA and Hefeweizen. You don't want to miss the live DJ or Yazoo raffles and giveaways. Best part? No entry fee. With Yazoo as the official sponsor, you know you're in for a great time. Join us Sunday, May 30th on the rooftop of City Tap on 3rd Avenue in downtown Nashville. Hello, early risers, self-starters, and seasoned pros. Welcome to Thompson Machinery, your local cap dealer. With offers like 0% for 60 months, it's easy to stop by and stay a while at your home for cat compact equipment. Whether you're a business owner or contractor, buying or renting, at Thompson Machinery, it all starts with hello. Stop by today and ask about 0% for 60 months on select new cat compact equipment or visit tmcat.com slash big time support. Terms and conditions apply. The mid Falls Football, 104.5 The Zone, WGFX Gallatin, Nashville, Accumulus Station, trending now at 104.5 The Zone. It is 10.02. Good morning. I'm Lucas Panzica. The Nashville Predators are back in Raleigh tonight for Game 5 in the Best of 7 Series against the Carolina Hurricanes. Series is tied up 2-2 two two after a pair of double overtime wins by the Preds in Bridgestone Arena over the weekend. Don't miss pre- and post-game coverage with myself and Alex Doherty on 104.5 The Zone TV and A to Z Sports tonight as we go live at 6.40 for a 7 p.m. puck drop. Julio Jones went on FS1's Undisputed yesterday answering a phone call from Shannon Sharp, possibly not knowing he was on the air and saying, quote, I'm out of there. When asked if he was staying in Atlanta, Jones also denied any rumors that he'll sign with the Cowboys, saying, right now, I just want to win. Falcons also announced the signing of former Titans wide receiver Tajay Sharp yesterday. Falcons head coach Arthur Smith set to speak to the media shortly. Aaron Rodgers opened up about his relationship with the Green Bay Packers last night in an interview with Kenny Main on SportsCenter, saying his issues with the organization did not stem from drafting quarterback Jordan Love in 2020, but it's about philosophy within the organization. With, yeah, with my situation, look, it's, it's never been about, uh, you know, Never been about the draft pick, uh, picking Jordan. I love Jordan. He's a great kid. Um, you know, he, he, a lot of fun to, to work together. Uh, I love coaching staff. Love my teammates. 
For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once in your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Rising to the top with A to Z sports quicker than any Titans. or increasing capacity for game six. That'll be on Thursday in Bridgestone Arena. Uh, you're, they're going from 12,135 fans to 14,107 fans. Apparently, the tickets go on sale right when we get off the air for the general public. Very exciting. Very exciting to see a near full house. At Bridgestone Arena, I you know I don't know what the official attendance was for Game Four on Sunday afternoon, but it looked like they might have had a few more people than twelve thousand. Looked like more than fourteen thousand. Yeah, so you know maybe they're uh maybe they're a little behind, or maybe they're uh maybe they are just you know putting it out there for the public so they don't get popped for any kind of capacity violation. I'm not sure if there's like a fine system in place for that, like the fine system that we have around here. By the way, Lucas, how the hell are we going to do the fine system? Because, like, they, this thing has been <laughs> this thing has been uh, mutated in a way that I'm not sure <laughs> how to do it at this point. Because what we, what we, what we wanted to do is set up a, a, a way for me to be held accountable for when I'm late, for when I screw up, for when I use crutch words. Basically, for those of you who are watching us, on Zone TV to be able to have a little bit of a bit, okay? So we set up the fine system for me. And then we got into some legal stuff that, you know, HR wanted to make sure that everybody's buttoned up and that if you're not comfortable getting fined, well, we don't want to have some kind of situation where there would be uh, be anything that would (laughs) fall back on the company, basically. (laughs) So now, and also, we're, we're doing it to raise money for charity, for Home Street Home. It's an incredible charity. Um done by Stephen Young, my friend, and his his family, his staff that help basically rehabilitate homeless people across Nashville, Metro Nashville, and around the city. But now this thing has become so, so complicated, Lucas, I'm not quite sure how to execute the fine system. Did you read that email that I sent to you? Because, of course, we're live producing the show on air, and if you haven't had time, I understand. It's far too complicated for my dumb brain. Okay. Well... We're going to work through this together because we want to raise money for a good cause and also we want to give you a reason to laugh at me because that's all what, that's, that's what this show is built around. How many different ways can we publicly humiliate me for the audience's entertainment, which I'm signed up for. That's basically my entire career. I'm very comfortable with it at this point. But it's been bogged down. We have some kind of solution, so we'll get to that. Anyway, I don't know how I got off on the fine system. I am off to a bad start today. <laughs> I am not doing well. I'm very upset. Long before I walked into this studio, even though Ron Slay, seeing Ron Slay at 10 a.m., put a little bit of a smile on my face. Not that Jason and Ramon don't, but Buckethead has tweeted me, what Twitter blowtorching poll do you have for us today? Well, we'll get to the Nashville SC 
Twitter people here in a second because what happened to Don Davenport yesterday was funny for a minute, and then I saw how out of control it got, and then I was pissed. So I'll yell about that later on. But today was Zone Staff Picture Day for the on-air staff. So me, actually, J. Martin Ramon weren't there because they were on the air. So I think they've already had their picture, pictures taken. Somehow they ducked out on picture day. But anyway, me, Blaine, Mickey, Dawn, Brent, and Slay. Okay? We all went to the uh, second Cumulus location downtown, not the one that we do the uh, radio show from here. So I'm on my way to picture day. Picture day is at, is at 8 a.m. And I'm, you know, I don't have a problem getting up early. For whatever reason, I got up at 345 this morning. I feel... Uh, so we were already off to a rocky start with how my mood was going to be today. But I'm I'm fully prepared for picture day. I've done my laundry. I know what I'm going to wear. Uh, I've, I've shaved. I look presentable. But I did not anticipate trains that run downtown at 8 a.m. in the middle of rush hour. So I'm about 25 minutes late to picture day. So I show up. I'm already pissed off. And then the act of picture day is something that is so uncomfortable to me. Like, I've hated it since I was, a, since I was a, a grade schooler, a high schooler. You don't take pictures. Well, I guess you take senior pics, uh, senior pictures before you go to college, but there's no kind of, like, college picture situation other than, you know, the drunken ones that end up on Facebook that will cost people jobs, I'm sure, at some point in their future employment. But picture day is the worst, all right? So I show up. I'm already upset because I'm late. Even though I've had all morning to be there on time, it's my fault. It's fine. I'll be accountable. But picture day is the worst. And it's not the fault of the photographer. Uh, Allie, who is our photographer today, she did a great job working with all of us. Um, all of us are, are hard to handle in our own uh, regard, except for Mickey. Mickey's pretty easy. And Brent. Uh, those, those two, they, 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 they're like water. They flow. But the rest of us are, are difficult. Me in particular. And I'm, I'm, I should be easy because I'm a one-man show. Lucas didn't come to picture day with me. He got out of it. I'm not sure how. But I show up, and then we're asked to do, you know, a variety of different poses. They're moving us back and forth between various walls, backdrops that we're going to be taking pictures in. Do I sit in the chair? Do I lean forward? Do I put my elbows on my knees? Posing for pictures. It is by far and away the worst. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm just an uncomfortable human being in general. Like, I'm awkward. There's a picture out there of me at our friends out at Two Rivers Ford. And I had to take, well, I didn't have to take, but we were we were announcing, uh, we were announcing the, the deal that Two Rivers Ford and A to Z Sports had done together. And I went out there to take pictures with one of their fantastic vehicles. And I don't know what, to, I'm like Ricky Bobby. I don't know what to do with my hands in pictures. So I'm like, going back and forth between putting my hands in my pockets, like putting my hands in my back pockets, which looks really awkward. I ultimately ended up in this awful double thumbs up pose that just makes me look like I have no idea what I'm doing. It's the worst part of all of it. Why do we? St- why is picture day still a thing? It's expensive, I'm certain. I didn't pay for it, but it's a, I'm certain it costs money. It's wildly inefficient. The phone on my, or the camera on my phone is probably nearly as good as the cameras that are being used to take said photographs, not to diminish, again, I'm not doing any of this to diminish the work of the lovely photographer that we worked with today. She was a stud. But, you know, I got portrait mode on my phone. Like, somebody just take a picture of me talking in front of the microphone so I don't have to think about it. I don't have to, you know, I I don't have to hear, hey, laugh a little bit. While we're taking the picture, so your smile looks more natural. <laughs> I can't. I'm physically incapable. So I go to picture day at 8 a.m. Then I get here to the studio. I'm already in a huff. Lucas is sitting in the green room. He's ready for our pre-show meeting. I immediately go into my laptop bag and for realize that I've forgotten my charger, so I have to run home. I'm back at the show. I'm back at the show, back at the studio by 9:20, and all of this is a fine. <laughs> but now we can't figure out the fine system. So it all comes full circle. I'm very, very frustrated. We should probably make for a good show. I don't know. Normally when I'm bothered, we do a better show. But the picture day thing, shoot it right into the sun. Because I'm sure, you know, it's I've been up since 340, and that's not the photographer's fault. But my, my eyes look puffy. 
I, uh, I, I just, I just, I just hate it. I just hate it. Am I out? Of, am, I, am I out of line on this? Well, you've like, been, you've been up since when? Three forty. Why? I don't know. It's just it's on you. I mean, yeah. Normally, normally it's like four forty-five, four fifty. Today, for whatever reason, I couldn't sleep. So I got up, and now my eyes are very puffy, and now I'm being photographed, and now I'm being asked to like hunch over and like put your put your elbows on your knees and maybe lean against the wall, put your thumbs in your pockets. Like everybody, just get the hell away from me. Take the picture and be done with it. Do you have your little like eye? What is it? What do you call it? Oh, my under eye roller. Yes. No, it's not my laptop bag. I left it with my charger. <laughs> <laughs> the most essential parts of the show. It really is. Honestly, like, because we're on camera now for all three hours, I have I have under-eye moisturizer, which is not like the little strips that you put under your eyes, uh, but it's like this roller that my girlfriend got me, and it makes it, it does a world of good for the under-eye puffiness, but I have not had it for, like, the past two days. <laughs> the sunken grave says, are we going to talk Preds or Picture Day? This is insufferable. Oh, boo-hoo. <laughs> Poor you. Yes, game five is tonight. We're going to spend some time on it. Uh, complain a little less. Now is my time to complain. I am the one paid to complain. So you're going to have to tough it out. <laughs> I had to get that off my chest. But we are going to talk about the Preds. We'll do that around the noon hour. Alex Doherty will be here. Keith Bullock will also be here. Titans great. Looking forward to that. And if you want to jump in, 615-737-1045. But coming up next, we got to talk about what's happened with Nashville SC, not the team, but the Twitter, <laughs> because Don Davenport went for a dive into the social media sewers with me yesterday, and it didn't go well for a variety of reasons. We'll tell you what's going on on the other side. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. Ramon Foster brings 11 years of NFL experience.
yesterday. Now, the polls are not, <laughs> the polls are just meant to be for fun. Like, it's just something, I don't want to say just to get a reaction out of people, but it's not anything serious. It's not like, ha- hell, half the time the polls don't even end up, like, as a topic of discussion on the radio show. Now, mostly that's my fault because I get distracted and I have ADD and we go all over the place and there's nobody in here to stop me. Lucas can only do so much. <laughs> but we put out a poll yesterday off of the sports weekend, particularly particularly with Nashville SC. I asked, or rather Lucas asked from my account, is Nashville SC being undefeated enough to get you involved? Now, 55%, well, 55.3% of the audience voted. Yes, that's great. They have not lost a game. They have had four draws at this point, two victories, no losses, undefeated. Now, we don't do this because that, that didn't even make the radio show yesterday. Like, I think, I think we simply mentioned that Nashville SC won and then moved on to the Preds because that is the thing that the larger amount of the audience cares about. They're in the playoffs. It's more important right now. It's it's a big deal, certainly. We're going to pay attention to SC because it's a playoff team last year. They look to be competent, more than competent again today or or right now. But it it didn't even make the show. And we had a lot of responses to it because soccer Twitter... The way that soccer Twitter reacts to stuff, and there's a little bit of this in hockey too, really any sport but the NFL and college football because they get the most love, so they don't feel like they need the attention, right? Everybody's going to talk about their sports regardless. Hockey and soccer are going to, are you know, they're going to need a little bit more clout. <laughs> or there's something, has you know, something has, has to happen that's disastrous in their sport for it to become mainstream or for it to be talked about Main Street. Now, part of, a part of this is a lack of education, frankly, from people tasked with talking in front of a microphone. I would be lying to you if I sat here and told you that I know all of the ins and outs of the game of soccer. I would say the vast majority of people in the United States talking on air, doing things like sports talk radio or podcast or whatever, unless they're specifically designated for soccer, mainstream sports media, not all that educated in terms of soccer. I'm raising my hand. I'm one of them. Okay? I want the game to grow. I would like to learn more about it. I would like to see the audience for Nashville SC grow as well. I'm certain that it will as long as they win. It's like anything else. You have a winner, people will care. But we put this out, and somehow it became polarizing. Now, maybe not necessarily in the way, not not in a way that was hugely detrimental to me because Dawn Davenport got more heat than anybody because she responded, and it blew up a little bit. But Will Bowling's brother, Wes, quote tweeted our poll and says, I like and admire Buck's work, but, quote, do you care about this? Radio doesn't do do it for me. Talk about the sport or don't, but there is a growing soccer audience in this town that will show up if you get into the details and stop debating whether they're worthy of discussion. I think that's a totally well-thought-out argument or position by Wes. I'm not pushing back on that at all. My thing is, from this standpoint, that's the only way that it's going to make it on the show. You know what I'm saying? Like, talk about it or not, if you want it ultimatum, if you want to make an ultimatum like that, that's fine. But at least here in Nashville, and if you guys want to call in and and correct me on this, the broadest set of the audience, always going to be football. The thing that the most amount of people care about that listen to this frequency, that listen to my my podcast, all of our podcasts um, of the live shows, that stream it on the app or listen to it or watch it on 104.5 104.5 The Zone TV, football. Football, 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 Preds football. <laughs> That's basically it. And I want to be able to have a conversation that gets the most amount of people involved. Now, maybe that's a polarizing way that I did it. Am I? Do you think we handled that the right way yesterday? I guess is what I'm asking, Lucas. Because we, we produced the show in real time. 
The content is always something that you guys have the ability to weigh in on. That's why the polls make it fun, because you guys can interact with us, and you can, and we can get the, the most full measure of what it is that you're thinking. But we, we put it out there for people to talk about, and, and soccer Twitter, like, rose up <laughs> in a way that I was not anticipating. Not necessarily in response to my poll, although I'm sure that Wes, that many people feel the way that Wes Bowling does. Talk about it or don't, but this do you care or not radio stuff, not for me. And I totally understand that. But the thing that pissed people off, or at least pissed the soccer community off, was Dawn. <laughs> Dawn Davenport responds to that poll yesterday. Says, don't they have four draws, question mark? So that counts as undefeated with the thinking man emoji. And the soccer people came after her in a way that was unpleasant. It was, some of it was, some of it was funny. Much more of it was deeply concerning about the way that some of you are comfortable talking on the internet to a woman. Like, do better. First and foremost, I, before, we, before we have some fun with this, I have to say, I was honestly disturbed. By some, of the, by some of the reaction, in fact, most of the reaction that Dawn got. Because it was not a nuanced conversation. It was not, hey, let's talk about this. Let me explain to you exactly what it is that soccer is. And, whether, and Dawn, Dawn knows soccer. She's covered soccer. She just doesn't like that it ends in draws. <laughs> you want a winner? You want a loser? Dawn, I, we were talking at picture day, speaking of picture day. We were talking to Picture Day today, and Dawn says, I need closure. Soccer doesn't give me closure. Soccer gives me draws, especially when you're citing an undefeated team that has more draws than wins. No losses, still undefeated. Nobody's disputing that. Dawn just having some fun. Because Mikey Dreamer writes in on Twitch, Buck was trying to get babyface sympathy with the soccer discussion involving Dawn yesterday. I mean, I really I really wasn't. I don't I didn't have any part in the conversation at all. We just Lucas put out the poll for my account. Dawn responded to it and the Twitter people came at her angry. So, I guess my larger question about this is would you rather us just ignore the sport? I don't want to do that. I am more than happy to have guests on to talk about soccer. Maybe that's the only time you want us to talk about soccer. We had general manager Mike Jacobs on the night before the the season opener. Lucas does the Nashville soccer show. Tonight, 9 p.m., myself, Will Bowling, Davey Shepard. Live streaming on all of the Zone's social platforms. Make sure you check it out. So it's not like we don't have soccer-specific content. And a complaint that I get a lot, and it's not from a lot of people, like most more, 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 uh, far more people like the show then don't like the show. Like what we do, then don't like we what we do. And I, I don't say that as a mean to like means to brag on ourselves. It's just, you know, I'm looking at the numbers. <laughs> so if if soccer people want us to talk like X's and O's soccer or don't talk about it at all, I mean, we're not going to talk about it at all, which I hate because Lucas loves it. I want to learn about it. I want to get more people involved in the conversation. Now, I mean, am I going to sit here and teach you about soccer for three hours a day? No. That's, that's not, that would not be the best use of my, my time and the best way for you guys to receive that kind of stuff. I just, I just don't understand why they, why they got as upset as they did, Lucas. Maybe you can articulate this a little better because these are your people, all right? These are, this is your back line. This is your supporters. These are your scarf-wearing soccer fans decked out in neon yellow and blue. What what am I missing here with the way that the reaction came after Dawn? Is it just because they didn't like her tone, or what happened? I, I was honestly very taken aback at the, the, that the reaction was as visceral as it was and that there was that much venom being spewed. Maybe we worded the question in a way that made it seem like you know people were glorifying the fact that Nashville SC is undefeated. Like, nobody is shouting from the mountaintops Nashville SC is undefeated. They're the best team in MLS. Oh no, I'm 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 praising them for being undefeated. No, no it's a good thing. There's only three teams in MLS that are that are undefeated. Sure. Like if that was an easy thing to do, there'd be more teams. Three out of twenty-seven are undefeated. But nobody is is, is glorifying it because Nashville. It's frustrating that Nashville has four draws to two wins. They should have won some of those games. 
Like, it's true that Nashville has one of the best defenses in MLS. They have not allowed a goal in, I think, four straight matches. That's an incredible stat. They also struggle to create and finish chances. That's also true. So, uh, I think, but I just think when people, when soccer fans, or like you said, hockey fans, when people come at their sport and the way of doing things in their sport, then that brings something out in them. Like, draws are just, it's just part of the game. Like, sometimes neither team deserves to win, and I think that's okay. Sometimes ne- <laughs> neither of you deserve yes. to win. Like, to, like, Don, and I love Don, uh, and, and, and some of the stuff that was being said to Don was, was horrible uh, yesterday. But Don's argument, and I, and I said this to Don in the green room, her argument was she hates participation trophies, and she thinks ties are like participation trophies. But my counter to her, which I said to her yesterday, was, well, to me, that's the opposite of participation trophies because neither of you win. You neither didn't win you, anything. You get one point. You don't get your three points. It's like, you know, in hockey, and I love hockey, but in hockey, you go to overtime. If you lose in overtime, you still get a point. And then let's do this skills competition in a shootout that does not happen in the postseason so that somebody can leave a winner. To me, that's more participation trophy-like than saying neither of you get to win, right? Sure. No, I'm 100% on board with that. And I'm just reading some of the responses right now on Twitter. Wes Bowling tweeted us, thanks for separating the two conversations yesterday. Disagreement equals great online bashing, not RJ just says, we don't give a damn about soccer. But, like, this is a pl- this is where I'm caught between, right? Yeah. Because there's a lot of people like RJ. But there's also a lot of Nashville SC fans. I mean, 20, 20-something thousand of them at Nissan Stadium on Sunday. It was a fun environment, yeah. So fun. And it could they should have won by more because of what we're talking about. They're not good at finishing. It was frustrating that they did, they did not win by more than one to nothing. But we have platforms to talk about this. The Nashville Soccer, Nashville Soccer Show tonight, Speedway Soccer is part of the Zone Network of podcasts. Wes Bowling does a great job on his podcast, their radio crew and TV crew. I mean, we'll have Tony Husband on the show one day. He's the Nashville's TV broadcaster. And if, if Nashville is in the playoff race, which they should expect to be at the end of the season, and they're pushing for an Eastern Conference title, then we're probably going to talk about it a little bit. But we also, we also know our audience. I mean, it works both ways. But I see what Wes was saying there. No, I listen, I thought, I thought Wes made the most compelling, I, again, not argument. We're just having, a, we're just having a, do, a, a dialogue, just having a conversation, just going back and forth and trying to understand each other's positions. Nothing that deep. And then suddenly it turns into this polarizing thing for whatever reason, whether there's some meathead just, that just wants to shout at Dawn because she's a woman woman in sports, and women in sports are treated horrendously. Horrendously. I hate that for all of my friends who work in sports that are females, whether it's Diana, whether it's Dawn, whether it's Madison Blevins, Emily Proud, all of our friends. The way they are treated by people on the Internet in the sports world disgusting and there was a lot of that yesterday yeah it was disappointing because what i <laughs> john michael has has written in, in on the twitch uh the twitch stream communist kickball jk <laughs> i had a bunch of people sending me you know we can't have this communist sport in nashville tennessee and then there's just a bunch of vlad putin gifts that end up in my mind it was a disaster on the internet yesterday some of again some of it made me laugh some of it made me horrified Nashville SC just doesn't move the needle, says Baby Formula, on YouTube. The entire league is a subpar product. Doesn't organically generate excitement. No, that's not true. How much? Okay, I didn't get to attend Nashville SC, uh, their match against Austin on Sunday. But I did go to their opener. I did go to their season opener, which, by the way, ended in a draw. Now, I don't like, I don't like the concept of draws for the same reason. But I'm not like I'm not going to completely dis- dismiss soccer because those are the rules of soccer. Like that's okay, just because it's not what I'm used to, just because it's not how I would like the end. I, you know, I need instant gratification. Somebody win, somebody lose. That's my biggest gripe. It may be a stupid one. Soccer fans are probably listening to this. Like, yeah, you idiot. It doesn't matter because, as Lucas correctly pointed out, it's not a participation trophy. You just wasted ninety plus minutes of your day plus halftime, not winning. Yeah, and it's hard to defend, like, scoreless draws. It's very hard to defend. Sure. I completely agree. Like, Nashville's been in two of those this season, and nobody – soccer fans hate that. But it also kind of makes it more special when you get into the playoffs or in Europe and Champions League or internationally, the World Cup, which I think is the greatest tournament in sports, when it is a knockout competition and you get into penalty kicks in a semifinal. It just heightens it that much more. 
Uh, look, it's just part of the game. It's a game that started in the 1800s. That's just how it is. Either you like it or you don't. Don doesn't like draws, and that's okay. Nobody is screaming from the rooftops that Nashville is undefeated. and glor- Nobody's spinning it. Like, they're not spinning anything. They just are undefeated. It's just what they are. But the, the people that went at Don and some of them the way they did it was was disappointing. Well, what I'm saying is the uh, the idea that it doesn't organically generate excitement. I went to this opener. I had a great time. Yeah, it was, was great. It was great competition. Now, it was uh, it was very, very much slanted in the way that Nashville SC was constantly on the, t- the, on the attack. The poor Cincinnati goaltender was diving all over the place. He was getting peppered after... After the initial goal by, I think, Cincinnati did score first. It went up 2-0, and Nashville had to come back. Yeah. Right. So they were playing catch-up, and, and so they were in a more desperate situation trying to trying to get the lead before regulation ended and then ultimately ended in, in a draw, which, okay, fine, whatever. Like, it cost me 30 bucks to watch fun soccer, and it ended in a draw. Like, it's not the end of my life. I just don't – I don't want to feel – I don't want soccer fans to feel, Nashville SC fans to feel, that we're ignoring their sport if they don't want us to talk about it the way that the larger population is capable of talking about it. The way that poll is positioned is because everybody's going to have an opinion on it. That's as inclusive as I can be. The minute that I start going into detail on soccer conversation, if you don't know the rules, you're going to tune out. We're just trying to get the most possible people involved because we want everybody to feel like they're a part, a part of the conversation. We're not always going to be able to accomplish that. But that was the way, that was the approach that we took. And then it ended up starting a fire in Don's mentions anyway. Which, she, you know, she said, she said, is this how you live every day with people like at your neck? The answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> That's why I'm like this. And Don's, by the way, Don is one of these people because Don can't not look either. Dawn is in her mention. She is at people. There's very few people out there that can't, that are able to not look, right? I mean, I mean that I don't takes know. a you special get, skill. You get to a certain point. Like, I was very happy on Sunday for because I was at my sister's graduation. My phone was physically off. It's probably the first time my phone has been off. Like, turned all the way off? Turned all the way off. It's the first time I've done that, probably since the first time I've had a cell phone. Yeah. I've had a cell phone <laughs> since second grade. I don't think I've ever done that. Right? It gets, it get, we're, we work in sports, constant news, especially with. You know, my life as a as a Titans reporter, it's just there's something Lou, Julio Jones trade is always around the corner, so you can't be disconnected from social media like that. But if you guys want to jump in, we'd love to hear your opinions on it. We have comment, by the way, from Falcons head coach Arthur Smith on Julio Jones six one five seven three seven one zero four five. We'll continue to take your reaction because some of you have called in. You want to chime in on this particular topic. We'll also fill you in on what Arthur Jones had to say about the Julio jo- excuse me, Arthur Smith had to say about Julio Jones. I'm going to shut up, and we'll talk about it on the other side. Or we'll take Matt really quick. 615-737-1045, and then we'll take more calls on the other side. Matt wants to talk about the soccer discussion that we're having this morning. How's it going, Matt? We appreciate the call. Hey, what's up, man? So, um... I'm a big Manchester City fan, and I have been for basically my whole life because of my family. All my friends, I played, you know, intramurals at App, uh, that Arsenal fans, all that stuff. When I moved to Nashville, there is actually a – there's different clubs that you can go and watch soccer games with at all types of bars. Like the Man City used to be at the Germantown Pub. Now we're at the attic above um, uh, Fat Cat Slim's. And there's, like, 30 to 40 people that show up. There is an underground soccer community here. And, like, for the people who are, like, I don't care, you know, it's like the people that come at these comedians, like, if you don't like it, then don't watch it and don't complain about it because you sit in your basement in in your mom's house. Like, it's just annoying to me. So, uh, Nashville SC is awesome for the city, man. I'm all about it. Even though I watch the Premier League, I'm I'm, I'm totally supporting Nashville SC. Um, So, thanks, guys. Hey, we appreciate the call, Matt. I listen. One, you know, don't don't yell at people for living in in their parents' basement if you're trying to bring them into your fan base. You know, that's the thing. That's the thing that got lost a little bit yesterday. Diplomacy. But if you want to chime in, six one five seven three seven one zero four five six one five seven three seven one zero four five. We'll talk more about this on the other side. We'll also tell you what Arthur Smith had to say about Julio Jones. 
down there in Atlanta. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. The Titan Station. Yes! This is 104.5 The Zone.
you know, like a Negroni, which is something that I had the other day for the first time, is terrible. Absolutely awful. Okay, they, they just drink regular beer. These are just regular people that drink regular beer at these games. These are your people. Defend. I'm the one out here defending your people. Like they, they sell Miller Lite at Nissan Stadium, all right, at soccer games. Like, it's okay. Puka says, hated the nasty part of the reaction, but soccer fans on Sunday saw a team desperately fighting for a draw, a draw that would have had a huge impact on that team and others in EPL. But a lot of those so-called soccer fans should be ashamed. Talking about the way the people handled, handled Dawn, to which Rube Fleetwood adds, you overestimate the mental wellness of the idiots on this website, which is so. That's a good point. Yeah, people are dumb. <laughs> I'm dumb. People are dumb. Especially on the internet. With the soccer thing, though, I think, uh, I think the situation for me I think the situation for me is, you know, I'm going to try to learn about it. Lucas is here as a resource. I'm definitely going to attend more games because I had a great time at the Nashville SC game. But when it comes to the on-air topic of conversation, we probably won't get into it outside of when big events happen. And I think that's probably the best way to appease everybody because I want them to feel included, but there's only so much you can do. As, As much as I hate to say it, like, and, and I try to do this in terms of growing the sport in this market. Like, it's not our jobs to do that. You know what I mean? What? On this show. Like, oh. It is not this show's job to, gr- to grow the love of soccer in this market. I, that's more on soccer. Um, and, 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 but I take kind of some responsibility for that because I have platforms to do that. But I know not to hijack this platform that we have on this show to just try and push you know, try to push soccer on people that don't want to hear it. People that want to hear our soccer talk will listen to the Nashville Soccer Show tonight, and we'll do our part, but I don't think it's up to us or it's our responsibility to make everybody that listens to this show love soccer. Julian says, as an NSC fan, I vehemently disagree with what Dawn has had to say about the team. That's all I said. Or that all said, I completely agree that there should have been a regular discussion at times that went way beyond that, and the treatment of Dawn was out of line. Yeah. That... That much we can get consensus on. If not, if nothing else today, that we are going to have to agree upon. Now, I did also tell you that Arthur Smith was speaking to the Atlanta Falcons media. Uh, and, of course, the conversa- the topic of conversation has been Julio Jones. And if you want to jump in, 615-737-1045 is the number that you dial. But <laughs> for the information that we would like to relate to you from Arthur... Um, there's no information to be found because <laughs> I'm looking at Di- our friend Diana Rossini's Twitter feed right now. She's in that Zoom. Falcons head coach Arthur Smith on the Julio Jones situation. Quote, I'm going to keep those conversations with, with, that we have with our players private. And then we go to our friend Mike Giardi of the NFL Network, also in this Zoom. I'm sure there's a great many people that are asking Arthur questions today. Did Julio Jones ask for a trade before the draft? Arthur Smith says, I'm not going to comment on that. Man, Atlanta media is understanding exactly like Art. I think the conversation that we had with Art on this radio show probably, and and I'm not bragging on us. I'm just saying, like, I know how to talk to Arthur Smith because I've worked with him before. So I understand that he's going to cut you off at the pass more often than not when you try to get into too much detail because he understands the power of a no comment which is exactly what's happening this morning in Atlanta. On Arthur, on Julio Jones wearing a Dallas Cowboys sweatshirt, Arthur Smith, quote, it's irrelevant. (laughs) Julio basically said the same thing. Oh, God. I just, like, for all, all of the complaining that people do about Mike Vrabel and the way that Mike acts in the press conference, like, I'm so grateful that he is the way that he is. Oh, they're gonna love Arthur Smith down there. Oh, Brutal, and I and I like Art too. I I've I've had good conversations with Arthur in Zoom or otherwise, but he's he is not here to he's not he's not there to do the stand up routine like Bravel is. That is something that is unfortunate. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five is how you jump in. We'll get into what it would cost to go get Julio Jones here in just a second. But first, Scott has called in from Beth Page. He wants to weigh in on the soccer conversation. Good morning, Scott. Hey, Buck, I never thought I'd ever enjoy a soccer topic on, on the radio, but I'm actually enjoying this. 
thanks for not using your your platform to promote something like soccer. I mean, PK used to be really bad about that, but I'm glad Lucas has his own show where he can promote it the way he wants to do it. I think that's good the way y'all isolated that and and and, and cater to those to that to those fans. Um, you know, real quick, I, I come from the generation. I'm about 18 years older than you, Buck, but I come from the generation when they used to have ties in college football. Mm. And man, you talk about driving people nuts. I mean, I we, I'm like Dawn. I, I want a winner and a loser, no doubt about it. I mean, I would rather lose than draw any day of the week. But the people that we're going after on Twitter, you know, that's pretty that's pretty cold. But uh, anyway, man, I'm not a huge soccer fan. I'm not. I don't watch it. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it, and I really don't even like it on the radio that much. But you know, as a, I appreciate athletics, and I appreciate people that can do things that, that several other people can't do physically. So I appreciate the athletic side. And I used to feel the same way about hockey, but I don't feel that way anymore. We actually watch in-season games now on hockey, and I used to never turn a hockey game on and never thought about going to watch the Preds play. But we, we, we really enjoy hockey now. And that was a, even before the Stanley Cup run they had. So Anyway, I think I think people need to appreciate athletics and just give it their time and move on, but not say shut it down. Because if I could shut something down, it'd be baseball. Thanks, guys. Hey, thanks for the call, Scott. That, that's the thing. Like, you just got to give it time to grow on you, you know. And if you, and if it's not for you, move on. Yeah, and that's okay. That that's is a totally very, fine. Very well thought out point by Scott. We we have we have a smart audience. This is why I love you guys. You do a great job parsing through it. We I I do not lump all people in with some dumb people that behaved poorly on the internet yesterday. But I'm trying to find a way where we can all talk about something that's relevant. And if this is the way that we got to do it, that's fine too. With that, with, go ahead. With, with all that being said, get ready for me to be an obnoxious soccer fan when the Euros come around in about two weeks. No, no. Listen, I'm already having to fight you on your, your Vols homerism, your Preds homerism. Like I'm having to try and tamp it down to keep this show on the rails. All right, all right, all right. All right. Voice of the fan, Lucas Panzeca. Nashville Soccer Show at 9 p.m. tonight on 104.5 The Zone's streaming platforms. When we come back, we'll talk about the Julio Jones situation. <laughs> Arthur Smith did not shed much light on it, but I will. We'll tell you what's going on with that coming up next. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. Getting you fired up every weekday afternoon. I'm telling you, man, I'm fired
WGFX Gallatin, Nashville. A Cumulus Station. Our season never ends. Your home for Titans and Falls football. Trending now at 104.5 The Zone. It is 11.03. Good morning, I'm Lucas Panzica. The Nashville Predators are back in Raleigh tonight for Game 5 in the Best of 7 series against the Hurricanes. The series is tied up 2-2 two two after a pair of double overtime wins by the Preds in Bridgestone Arena over the weekend. Don't miss pre- and post-game coverage with myself and Alex Doherty on 104.5 The Zone TV and A to Z Sports. We will go live tonight at 6.40 for the 7 p.m. puck drop. Also, Bridgestone Arena announcing an increased capacity for Game 6 when they return to Nashville at over 14,000 fans. Julio Jones went on FS1's Undisputed yesterday, answered a phone call by Shannon Sharp, possibly not knowing he was on the air, and saying, quote, I'm out of there. When asked if he was staying in Atlanta, Jones was also denied any rumors he will sign with the Cowboys, saying, right now, I just want to win. The Falcons announced the signing of former Titans wide receiver Tajay Sharp yesterday. Falcons head coach Arthur Smith spoke to the media earlier today and refused to comment on the Julio Jones situation. Aaron Rodgers opened up about his relationship with the Green Bay Packers last night on SportsCenter, saying his issues do not stem from drafting Jordan Love last year, but rather a difference in philosophy. Philosophy. You know, you know, and, and maybe forgetting that it is about the people that make the thing go. It's about, it's about character. It's about culture. It's about doing things the right way. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once in your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. The most successful streaming and podcasting talent in Nashville is Buck Rising. And now he has a... Brayden is in Dixon. He wants to talk about Julio. What's up, Brayden? Hey, how's it going? Going great. Good. Well, I have a theory. I believe the Titans management passed up Elijah Moore in the first round of the draft to get Julio Jones because they knew he'd be available. Well, I think. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was so mad to see Elijah Moore go, go to the Jets. Uh, I was really hoping we'd get him because I know we needed somebody a little faster in the slot because we got A.J. Brown on the outside. He's a little stronger, a little beefier, and get up in those in those uh, high high 50-50 balls. But really, I, I was I was really mad to see Elijah Moore go. I think he's going to be the next best, uh, next best thing, but, you know, credit to the Jets for getting him. Um, but, you know, I started thinking after getting so mad about Elijah Moore and, and then looking into Julio Jones' situation that maybe the Titans knew – that Julio was going to be available and they were going to make a jump for him. What do you guys think? Well, everybody knew that Julio was going to be available. That that came out long before the draft. I appreciate the call, so it's not just exclusive to the Titans. Um, and all, I mean, listen, they like Des Fitzpatrick. They traded back up to get him. So I understand that everybody had the obsession with Elijah Moore. A.J. Brown loves Elijah Moore. Best buds in college. Probably still good friends now. You saw the interaction between Julio and Elijah. On draft night, excuse me, AJ and Elijah. I got all my, I've got my wide receivers mixed up at this point. Too many 11s in my life. But, um, yeah, everybody knew Julio was available. 
prior to the draft. In fact, the Falcons wanted a first-round pick for Julio Jones before the draft. And frankly, right now, you're just not going to give up a first-round pick for a player who's going to be 33. He's 32 right now. Julio Jones only played in nine games last year. This is somebody who was not a stranger to injury. This is the part of his career and any player's career, most players' career. I'll have to say that given that Tom Brady is still wandering the NFL out here winning championship after championship and caving people's skulls in. I, for the Julio Jones situation, you're not going to get a first-round pick for him, especially because you have now this audio of Shannon Sharp and Julio Jones talking on Undisputed yesterday where Shannon Sharp, we're not sure, nobody said one way or the other whether Julio Jones knew he was on the air or not, but if you missed this interaction yesterday on FS1, this is how it went down with Skip, Shannon, and Julio Jones. We call? Okay, we are calling. We're calling. We're calling. Hmm. You watching, Julio? I really hope he answers here. Julio, have the guts to pick up the phone. <laughs> What's happening? Yeah. All right. Julio. Hold on, hold on. Let me put you on. <laughs> Do you hear me? I got you. This is your favorite uncle. What's going on, bro? Man, nothing much. Try to go meet up with my brother. What's happening with you? Man, look, you want to go to the Cowboys, Julio, or you want to stay in Atlanta? Oh man, nah, I'm out of there, man. You He's out? out. Of there? He's out of there. Oh, Are you going to? Ideally, where would you like to go? Uh, right now, I'm just. I want to win. Okay. Yeah. We don't go to Dallas. If you go, to, you ain't winning in Dallas, Julio. Uh, you already, you already, man, listen, come on, man. You already know I know. Okay. <laughs> you, you remind him of we're on television Ask right why now? we're the Dallas. Listen, sure. listen. You know how people is, man, with all that going right. on with the, the picture? Yeah. yeah. You know, all that stuff like that. Okay. Man, I ain't never been on that. You know what I'm saying? Okay. That's good enough. Yeah. Julio, I'll talk to you later. Thanks for calling me back. We on air, but I appreciate you calling me, dog. You know I know my nephew is going to pick up. <laughs> Oh yeah, nah, nah, yeah. I ain't, I ain't going, I ain't going to Dallas, man. I never thought, and I never thought about going to Dallas. Okay, I appreciate that, bro. Enjoy the rest of your day. Now he might not yeah. have any choice. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that is courtesy of Undisputed on FS1 yesterday. Shannon Sharp, Skip Bayless, Julio Jones, and I'm not, I'm not aware of the name of the, uh, the lady that hosts it. I've never actually seen Undisputed. Just the clips that they put out, and Shannon Sharp tweeted that clip out himself yesterday. Because hey, Uncle, Shannon, Uncle Shannon <laughs> understands how to get some clout now. He knows what he's doing. So how much does that really damage the leverage, any, any leverage the Falcons might have had? Because not only that, and the report Ian Rappaport saying that he formally requested a trade with the organization months ago. I mean, listen, they didn't have much leverage to begin with. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he is a great player, historically great player. Julio Jones probably, and and it's difficult for wide receivers now because you can't really do it off the numbers anymore. And then you're looking at championships and, and then it becomes a much different situation about like Hall of Fame caliber player. I don't think anybody that would argue or would argue against Julio Jones as a Hall of Fame caliber player, even understanding that he's not won Super Bowls uh, and that wide receiving, receiving stats in general, now with the way the passing offenses have blown up, um, it's a little difficult. There's a bit of a log jam with those guys. But anyway, like their leverage was not there. They, there, was no, there was no opportunity for them to trade him before the draft for this exact reason. The whole reason, the whole reason that they can't trade him until at least next Wednesday is because of this massive cap hit that Julio Jones is going to cost. Under no circumstances can they trade Julio. I mean, they can, but it would hurt them very, very badly because of the finances of all this. It's the whole reason they got to let him go. Atlanta has the second worst salary cap situation. When you're just looking at top 51, Atlanta's only got $357,000 left to play. And I know that sounds like a lot of money, but not in the NFL, not on, not against the salary cap. It's the Saints at the top, or at the bottom, rather, in terms of the worst cap situation than the Falcons. They have to get rid of him, but they have to wait until after June 1st. And the reason for that being is because of the way 
that his cap situation looks. Anytime after June 1st, and I wrote about this for A to Z Sports Nashville.com yesterday, anytime after June 1st, if Julio is traded, Atlanta can then defer the $15.5 million a million dollars in debt salary cap into 2022. They have to split this money up over 21 and 22. They can't do that until after June 1st. But do we put too much stock in the ability for other teams to say, well, we know he doesn't want to play for you next year, so we're not going to give you a first-round pick. Dawn Davenport has texted me and said the woman is Jenny Taft on Undisputed, a reporter, uh, also a reporter, good at her job. So forgive me. Apologies to Jenny uh, to Jenny Taft for not giving her the proper credit. But thank you for Dawn. Thank you to Dawn Davenport, who is listening at home or in her car. I don't know where Dawn is. I don't know if she went home after photo day. But she's uh, she perhaps she's wandering the halls like Ron Slay, who you, you literally need to lock the door to keep him out of here. I'm sorry, Lucas. What did you say? <laughs> I got distracted. I was reading my text. Do we put too much stock in the ability for other teams to say, we know he doesn't want to play for you next year, so we're not going to give you a first-round pick. That's not going to be in the discussion. The, no, it's not It's not because of that. It's he, They're not getting a first-round pick for him because of age and injury. It's it's totally excluded from, you know, say the Cowboys offered a first. I mean, the Cowboys aren't going to offer a first. I mean, okay, let me not say that definitively because Jerry Jones is an insane person and could, in theory, offer a first-round pick. But – there, you you have to put stock in it because he's compromised their situation. Now, Atlanta, by the way, the Falcons' own website put out an article on Julio Jones talking to Shannon Sharp about being out of Atlanta. They got caught by surprise as much as anybody, which is why I think that the Julio Jones situation may have been not, he may not have been aware that he was on national television, but I'm sure he found out fast. When you look at the situation for Julio. In fact, we'll get into this. Well, no, we won't get into this on the other side. We'll save this because Keith Bullock is coming up next. In fact, we'll ask Keith about what he makes of the Julio situation. But more importantly, we're going to get into the Titans linebacking situation with Titans great Keith Bullock. He joins us next. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. Off season. Yeah, like that exists. We have no idea.
Had nice. a nice coffee, a little uh, little breakfast sandwich. Very, very nice. Um, all right, Keith, you uh, you hype about the idea that Julio Jones could be a Titan? Um, you know what? I don't I don't get too hyped these days. You know, I haven't played it and then be on the outside for over a decade. I like to sit. I get more enjoyment sitting back and watching. But uh, I like the idea of it for sure. You know, to give um, you know a secondary threat to obviously um, AJ Brown for Tannehill um, in the passing game. Yeah, without question, and and we you know we try to keep expectations reasonable around here, and it's still something that makes you know is is very very much just just a hypothetical at this point. But for for just from the example of of what's happening, Keith, I don't know. Did you see the interaction with him and Shannon Sharp yesterday that went viral? Um, I did not get a chance to get to it yet, um, but I, I kind of got a, a slight glimpse of it. Sure. Something alluding to the fact that he won't be – he's not interested in being in Atlanta next year. Well, more – more yeah, that was that was the, the larger genesis of it. But just from your, your perspective as a former athlete, somebody who's dealt with media throughout the course of your career and then well after it, working in media a little bit yourself, um, Shannon, Shannon seemed to call Julio – live on the air without telling Julio that they were live on the air having as a as a former athlete yourself and understanding the relationship that athletes have with media and then athletes who go into media what how would you handle a situation like that if you were not told that you were being called and having a conversation about your career and your future live on national television yeah he uh, I think um you know Shannon definitely put Julio in a position, especially if he wasn't aware, um, to kind of show his hand. With that being said, um, it wouldn't be received well. And I I obviously wouldn't go public with the way I would handle it, but I definitely (laughs) um, would have to have a personal talk with um, Shannon Sharp when it came to that, because now you're, you're sitting out there um, very exposed, you know, um, and, and, you know, in a situation where um, I feel these teams and ownership has the upper hand, they really have the upper hand now. So now it turns into a hardball situation. There would, there would be a stern conversation between Keith Bullock and Shannon Sharp over some just love coffee. I'd imagine. And that's... <laughs> no question. No question. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be about the extent uh, that we would be willing to go. All right, so Keith, we we asked you on the radio show today, and and it's always uh, great to be able to have you on the air. But I, I was reading an article from Jim Wyatt on the Titans website this morning about Monty Rice, who's the linebacker out of Georgia that they just drafted in the third round. Grew up a Titans fan and talked about you know emulating or wanting to wanting to emulate you specifically. Brought you up by name, saying that Keith Bullock just played the right way, played with a chip on his shoulder on every snap, and that's kind of how I carry myself. And this is coming from Rice in, in Jimmy's article. Now, I, I'm, I'm sure that many linebackers coming up, not just playing for the Titans, but across the NFL, have kind of emulated the way that you carried yourself and the way that you were able to perform on the field. But what, what does it mean to you to still have younger generations looking up to you this way, even as you've been, as you said, removed from the league for over a decade at this point? Uh, I I think it's pretty cool. You know, um, it shows that as a young man, he was in tune to the game because obviously playing in a small market like Tennessee, uh, you really have to be a Titans fan to remember some of the older players. And um, for him to have his childhood dream to actually play in the NFL for uh, the Tennessee Titans on the team that – a player that he looked, um, you know, looked up to and may have uh, tried to put his style, you know, his style after. Um, I think that um, I think that's pretty cool to say the least. At K Bowl Fifty Three is where you could fo- where you can follow him, Keith. You you your your style would have fit so well in the way that linebackers are asked to play the position nowadays, as opposed to back in the early two thousands, uh, and how the game has evolved, how defenses have evolved have you seen anybody who kind of reminds you whether it's Tennessee or otherwise that kind of reminds you of the way or your physical abilities given how exceptional you were 
not only at, at, at playing the run and, and getting tackles for loss, but to be, to be able to cover as well, given that that's such a critical element of what linebackers are asked to do. Um, I, you know, I think um, I was blessed in a sense that, you know, I played in the late nineties, you know, when you were still, when there was still a physical game where there really weren't too many rules about how you took down the, took down your opponent or how, you know, wide receivers were allowed to block, how safeties were allowed to hit. So it was a much violent, much physical, more physical game. And for me to be developed in college as a safety, to go to linebacker in, in the NFL, I mean, it, at the end of college and in the NFL to play linebacker, I think, um, like I said, I was blessed to have been able to develop those um, cover skills that uh, would be huge now in this in this game that made me um, allow me to have a lot of success on third down and in passing situations. And, you know, look, having to be um, an undersized linebacker but have to play in the box in a seven-man front and be able to bang with the big boys that are, you know, 350 and you have those 280-pound, 260-pound um, fullbacks when there were fullbacks. So I think, um, you know, right now – there are guys that are like that, but I think by default they're asked to be one way or another. So um, it's hard to just say one guy, but there are definitely a lot of guys out there that I enjoy watching and their styles of play. No, without question. I mean, obviously you you were built physically different than what Jayon Brown is, but what kind of kind of listening to the way that you're talking about how you got your education basically at safety and then tra- yeah. tra- transferred to uh, or or transitioned into linebacker Jayon not not the same necessarily and and physically different than you were during your playing career but you can see some of those traits that have had to carry over into the modern passing game for linebackers to be able to hold up when you look at this group Keith with with Rashawn Evans Jayon Brown David Long and and now Monty Rice who we we've seen a little bit of in college at Georgia but we're not sure quite what he'll be at the professional level, what 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 stands out about this linebacking core as it's currently constructed? Um, I, I like um, the the example you used with Jayon because Jayon every year he's gotten better and he's gotten better in his passing game, um, his coverage. He always gets his hands on the ball, making turnovers, causing turnovers. He um, his coverage skills and he's gotten more stout in the run. Um, I like to see Rashawn take them take a couple steps forward you know um this is his uh i believe his fourth or fifth year whatever year it is it's the year that he should step up stop making the simple mistakes that might put the defense you know in a bad spot and just make the big plays that we expect him to make um as a first round draft pick and i'm definitely looking forward to seeing what um you know david long is going to do as long as well as rice and um, I don't want to leave out my man, uh, Buddy Dupree, coming over from Pittsburgh. Sure. He may not be uh, – we don't know where he's going to be physically, but I had some time – I spent some time with him in a Pittsburgh camp, um, and I know that he definitely brings the energy. He knows how to set the tone for the defense. You know, he's played in a lot of big football games, and if not anything, which is something that's lost in the NFL, and I think Coach Babel – and um, John Robinson see the benefit in getting, you know, um, veterans that may still have a little left in their tank on the field, but definitely can give a good knowledge to uh, some young up-and-coming football players in, in their locker room that might be on the verge or on the cusp of taking that, um, you know, step forward uh, to becoming um, big-time football players. Titans, great. Keith Bullock here with us on 104.5 The Zone. I, we'll talk about we'll we'll get back to the Bud Dupree part of that here in just a second, Keith. But I want to I want to go back to Rashawn because obviously he had his his fifth year option declined, so he is in his fourth season with Tennessee. They declined the option on his rookie his first round rookie deal, and and the the little mistakes that you're talking about are things that it seems have gotten I, I don't want to say progressively worse over. The course of his time here in Tennessee, but he hasn't quite taken the steps I think that everybody expected him to. When you watch Rashawn's game, when you talk about little mistakes that he's making that may put the defense in in jeopardizing positions outside of penalties, because obviously that's something that he's struggled with. What what kind of stands out to you about what you notice with Rashawn's game in these areas that he needs to improve in? Uh, you know, I just definitely, <clears throat> at this point of his career, 
Um, you know, and look, Rashawn and I have definitely sat down and talked. You know, it's just for me, I would like him to be, you know, to see him be more instinctive. And obviously, I watched the game totally different. They would not see these little things that I'm, you know, privy to. But at the same time, um, I definitely, it's just being more instinctive as you become more of a professional um, in your craft, you know. So as a former professional, you know, having a kind of little personal relationship with Rashawn, uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's not anything glaring that, um, you know, coaches or anything else would see, but um, just having that relationship with Rashawn, it's one of those things that I know he has the capabilities, and once he takes those steps, everyone will see the things that, um, I, that I know and that I see. Without question, I, th- I think everybody's been able to see what he, what he at times is, is physically capable of. He's obviously a, an outstanding athlete when you watch Rashawn and the plays that he makes on the goal line, the instincts that he has are, are things that you, you don't, co- I mean, you can yeah. coach them, but they just come so naturally to him the way that he sacrifices his body down there to talk. When you we were talking about, you know, banging around with the fullbacks in the late 90s and early 2000s, Rashawn Evans, very, very much a sea ball, get ball linebacker. I, I, I'm just, I, I'm so, I guess, Keith, with with Rashawn, and and then we'll talk about Bud Dupree. Does it say anything to you that with the with the injuries that they had at linebacker last year, that Rashawn Evans was not one of the players who was uh, tasked with the coach to uh, to player communication, the green dot. Rashawn Evans was never given that responsibility. Does that say anything to you as somebody who's played that position? No, I don't think the green dot means anything. And look, you know, Rashawn's my guy. This isn't a, you know, let's pin Rashawn up on the the wall and throw darts at him. But um, it's just a matter of focusing in on your craft. You know what I mean? And it's a matter of seeing what type of focus um, Rashawn comes into the season with. But Dupree, he may be that veteran that sees those things um, that can help Rashawn focus in and be the guy that, look, I'm waiting for him to be, and all Titans fans are waiting for him to be. Because like you said, we see him glimpse. So once he focuses in and takes that mentality every single snap at practice during the game, that'll just carry over, and it'll be like clockwork. And, um, you know, um, I think that I know he can do that. You know, that's just what I'm very – I'm just anxious to see that. Without question, I uh, I appreciate you being able to give us that insight because the audience obviously has questions about this and you having a relationship with Rashawn like that. I think it's important for them to be able to kind of hear your your standpoint from it, given that you've had time with him in a way that they obviously haven't. Keith Bullock here with us on 104.5 The Zone. So you, you were very, very uh, glowing in your, pl- in your praise for Bud Dupree. Obviously, the Titans are bringing him in to help bolster their defense, their front seven in particular. With, with the guys that they have up front right now, Keith, with Jeff Simmons, uh, Harold Landry now adding Danico Autry as well to be able to play interior defensive line, and the, where, where Dupree will line up is, is yet unknown to us, but we imagine that he'll be a variety of different places given how creative Vrabel likes to get. In, in, a, in a perfect scenario, though, when you look at these guys, how, how do you imagine that they are going to work together to be able to improve this unit from from the depths that it was at a year ago? Um, you know, I don't necessarily know exactly how Coach Vrabel plans to use um, Bud, but at the same time, I know Bud is very multidimensional. And, you know, I don't think fans should expect, you know, a 15-sack season, you know, all those big play things. But I definitely think the energy that he brings to the, the Titans, that he can bring to the t- Titans' um linebacker core can play a huge difference you know him having all the experience he has playing with those defenses in Pittsburgh and you know like I said earlier you know I was privy to um you know do the three-week intern with the Pittsburgh Steelers um you know a few years ago at a Pittsburgh Steelers camp and I just saw the energy that he brings during practice when things are dead and just the overall locker room guy that he is. So I think not saying that the Titans don't have that already, but I know anytime you can bring 
a new energy to a team that's on the cusp, kind of like when we brought in Chris Hope, Kevin Mawai, and David Thornton, those type guys. When you can bring those type guys into a locker room, regardless how they play, if they come in with the right mindset, um, it can make a world of difference for young players and that team overall. He is Keith Bullock, Titans great, kind enough to give us some of his time here on 104.5 The Zone this morning. Make sure you check him out at Just Love Coffee in Franklin. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Man, Keith, uh, take care. Thanks for uh, thanks for stopping by. It was good to chat. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. We will react to what Keith had to say on the other side. We'll talk a little bit about Rashawn Evans and this Brooks Kepka video that's gone viral across the internet. All that and more coming up next. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. Coming up today on Blaine and Mickey. Join us as we look ahead to the Preds Game 5 matchup with Carolina and we visit with Coach Mac. Yep, it's the Mac attack. Today, starting at 1 p.m. on 104.5 The Zone. I come from a military family.
hate. <laughs> I like hate in sports specifically. That makes me very, very happy, especially when it's caught on camera in a way that we can all enjoy together. Now, the audio of this is not something that we can play for you because Brooks Kepka was very, very comfortable letting the hate flow through him yesterday. Now, maybe, Lucas, do you, do you follow golf at all? Yeah, the majors. I'm not going to act like I'm, I'm watching the Valero Texas Open. Sure, that's we've we've cited that as an example of a golf tournament that we just don't watch like seven times now. Because <laughs> it was the it was right before the Masters when yeah. Jordan Spieth won it and everybody was freaking out. That's the one. We don't care about it. Just give me the Masters. No, I'm with you. I did not watch a single hole of the PGA Championship over the weekend. There's too much going on. Yeah, I did not. I saw I saw the clips of Phil after the fact because I was at my as I mentioned I was at my sister's graduation on Sunday. I saw a little bit of it on Friday, but not not terribly much anyway long story short brooks kepka was being interviewed by the golf channel after the pga championship on sunday now what is the genesis of the relationship or lack thereof between brooks kepka and bryson dechambeau do we have any idea i i do not well, let me let me do some digging yeah that's that you you do that and i'll i'll uh i'll spew for a little while so this video Goes viral yesterday on the internet. It's an outtake from the Golf Channel. And Brooks Kepka is doing a very professional interview. Seems to have everything together. And there's people walking behind Brooks Kepka in the background. Like throughout the course of the entire interview. Doesn't bother him at all. And then he catches sight of Bryson DeChambeau and this hat <laughs> that Bryson wears. What? It's, I don't know if it's a Kangol I don't know if it's the same kind of hat that Bruce Arian wears because, you you know, you love Bruce Arians for it. You hate Bryson, D Bryson DeChambeau for it. But a lot of people seem to not like Bryson DeChambeau, which I find interesting because um, I really enjoy watching him play. Certainly, I enjoy what he's physically done to himself to be able to compete differently in the game of golf. I enjoy that very much. Not as much as I like watching these two hate each other because DeChambeau walks – behind Brooks Kepka, and by the way, if you want to weigh in, 615-737-1045, 615-737-1045. DeChambeau just walks behind Kepka, and Kepka stops cold in the middle of the interview and just starts cursing all kinds of profanity, uh, a profanity laced. Well, I won't call it a, quite a tirade because Kepka's a bit of a robot, and he doesn't get too emotional but you can see it just wash over his face, the disgust, pure and utter disgust at the fact that Bryson DeChambeau is just in his just in his orbit at this point. They have to stop the interview cold and restart it because Kepka just starts cussing at <laughs> the idea that DeChambeau is behind him. So I don't know if something happened during the PGA Championship that brought this reaction about. I don't know. I know there is a little bit of pre-existing hatred with Brooks Kepka and DeChambeau. Lucas, maybe fill us in a little bit in all of your due diligence that you've done there behind the glass. Yeah, this is courtesy of HITC.com, which is a sports and entertainment news uh, outlet. It says, in 2019, Kepka made a comment on DeChambeau's slow play on the Golf Monthly Clubhouse podcast saying, quote, I just don't understand how it takes a minute and 20 seconds or a minute and 15 to hit a golf ball. It's not that hard. Uh, DeChambeau allegedly, well, not allegedly, he did fire back during a Twitch live stream, making fun of Kepka's physique for not having abs oh. after Kepka's photo shoot for body issue of ESPN, the magazine, uh, during a Twitch live stream where he's like playing a video game oh, yeah. and just made a dig at Kepka's physique. Oh man, that would be, that's like my worst nightmare to be able to, ha to do something because you got to be bold to do the ESPN body. Ma like, I don't think ESPN, the magazine isn't even a thing anymore. So I don't know if the body issue is still a thing, or if they just do, like, the body issue but put it on Instagram now? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I hadn't seen it in a while. But uh, to do the body issue, you got you to be supremely confident in what you look like physically because I, be, <laughs> I would not be in a position. I would not physically be, put myself in a position, especially not right now, especially not post-COVID, uh, to, to get out there and do that. But then to have somebody ridicule you, ridicule you about your physique in the body issue would cause me great angst. So, okay, uh, so there's so there's history here. There's backstory. I, I want to know what you hate, uh, if you hate anything, if you hate anything the way that Brooks Kepka appears to hate Bryson DeChambeau. Okay, I think 
a lot of the golf community is gleaning that Kepko was annoyed by the sound of DeChambeau's I don't, uh, spikes of his golf shoes. Oh, just him walking? That's what, like, there's this t- uh, Instagram account that's verified called Golfers Doing Things. Sure. And it says, with the, that video, Brooks is not a fan of Bryson. Wait, and wait, 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 wait. Something called Golfers Doing Things golfers has doing a check things. mark yes, before I do? Blue, blue check mark I, on Instagram. I hate it here. <laughs> I hate it here. The caption says, Brooks is not a fan of Bryson and his spikes. Ah. <laughs> so just, just the sound of DeChambeau walking behind him during an interview. So Because Ke- I, I don't know if Kepka even sees him, but I guess just hears him and is so annoyed by the sound of him walking that he has to stop the interview cold. It's incredible to me. 615-737-1045. What do you hate? <laughs> what do you hate with the level or what what lives up to the level of hatred in your life the way that brooks kepka hates bryson dechambeau casey is in lewisburg he wants to weigh in on the conversation what's up casey what's up book so yeah uh, i just wanted to i don't know if, if everybody feels this way in the golf community but most of the people i hang out with as far as golfers wise do not like bryson dechambeau i don't think he's like really uh that much on on tour actually, so I could see why Brooks Kepka gave him that, especially after the body shaming. Man, I didn't I didn't know about that. Well, wait, uh, but, why, why do why do people in the golf community? So you got to be more specific for me, Casey. What is okay, what is it about him? I mean, he just thinks he's I don't know. He, he's one of those guys that thinks he's better than everybody. Now that he's got his body right too, I mean, you just like I don't, I don't I don't know. He just got a big head, man. I mean, I, I, I don't I don't know, man. No, I'm with you. I, mean, I just, you can, I just you can. know he doesn't. Really, people don't like playing with him. Right. No, that's like, that's something I've heard before. Yeah, but, I mean, that's all I have for you, Buck. But, you, yeah, you always do a great job, my man. Keep up the good work. Hey, appreciate you, Casey. 615-737-1045 if you want to weigh in. Listen, if, if, you're, if you're cocky and if your ego is such that you think you're better than everybody else on the professional tour with the best golfers in the world, and DeChambeau has had some success. Like, you're allowed to be confident in yourself. It's that fine line between confident and cocky that make people dislike you in this way. Now, I don't Brooks Kepka is he's a bit of a robot. So I don't know if he uh I don't know if he has the I don't know if he has the capability. I'm certain that he's confident in himself and I've heard him interviewed before like he does pardon my take a lot for Barstool. Uh and you hear him uh you hear you hear the confidence in him, but something about DeChambeau, I guess just his attitude. Maybe rubs, his hat rubs me. Well, you don't like his hat. You're that's personal bias. I mean, not, the hat not, is not, fine. No, 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 no. You can't say maybe his hat when you're the one who hates the hat. <laughs> no, the hat is fine. I just feel like it, you got to be a kind of attention-seeking person to be that guy wearing that hat. No, no. major. Yeah, this is this is fraudulent on your part because you were spitting angry at the hat in the green spitting room. Spitting angry, my God. <laughs> Earlier, just just living. Make an offhand comment, and I'm spitting angry. <laughs> well, you say things very. You say things very. Forcefully. <laughs> I do. I do. That's just how I speak. 615-737-1045. Grant is in the borough. He wants to talk about Kepka. What's up, Grant? Yeah, I was just going to say, man, these two guys, they, they do have a really good rivalry going on, and they're just complete total opposite types of players. I think that's why uh, Kepka had just not, no patience for him. Even the sound of the metal spikes, like walking behind him, I think the fact that he wears metal spikes, just that – grinds at uh kepka um they, they just both hate playing together because one plays really fast kepka's a really fast player he doesn't really think about it a whole lot kind of grips it and rips it and you know bryson's over there doing calculations and getting out uh you know the protractor and everything to figure out his shot and how he's going to hit it so they, they just you know fire and ice just total opposite sure thanks for the call grant i appreciate that 615-737 1045. People are passionate about this. I mean, this video was all over the internet yesterday, and I want to uh, I want to get to as many people as possible. Corey in Hendersonville wants to chime in on Kepka versus DeChambeau. Good morning, uh, Corey. Good morning, Buck. I hope you're having a good day, man. I, I sure mean, am. I watched that video, and <laughs> what I got from it, or what I noticed from it, was when DeChambeau walked behind him. You know, I don't think Kepka, on his facial expression, realized that he had. But when you you could hear uh, DeChambeau talking in the background during the interview, and I think that's what pissed him off. Um, also, you had brought up like what triggers some of us, and if you got a second, I just wanted to kind of vent on Tim Tebow. Okay. 
<laughs> that took a that took a hard uh, we right always turn. have a second for that oh we always Corey. got a second for tebow please go ahead Corey. okay so this really irks me um the fact that tebow is getting a shot at tight end uh with the jacks and you know by all means if if he fails he fails great that just is more ammo for our arsenal because he's with the jacks but it's the fact that urban meyer is giving him an opportunity that he doesn't deserve and if you look at the fact that he's been out of the league for over nine years, he went to go play baseball, which he hadn't played since high school. He just, he seems to want to soak in the spotlight and it really irks me. Well, Corey, if, and, and, and I appreciate the call. Thank you. 615-737-1045. I see Cam and Lebanon. and we're going to get to him here in just a second. Um, but I just want to touch quickly on the, which is funny because this is, this is the level that Tebow is at where, we can be we can be a week removed from anything Tim Tebow. I haven't uttered his name. I haven't thought about him, but somebody's got to bring him up. And I'm not mad at Corey about it. It's just what Tim Tebow is. But if he wanted the spotlight like that, why didn't he just stay on national TV? Like SEC Nation, he could Tim Tebow, if he hadn't screwed around with minor league baseball and now this this freak show at tight end in Jacksonville, Tim Tebow could probably and he's not that good at and you know, I, I'm not like I don't want to be I don't want to be a jerk to Tim Tebow, but like Tim Tebow didn't blow me away as an analyst, right? He, he's he's fine, but he's Tim Tebow, and people freak out. So if he wanted the spotlight that badly, he would he would have just stayed sitting next to Marcus Spears and Paul Feinbaum and Laura Rutledge, and he would have gone through the roof. Uh, he but he's generating so much more conversation now than if he was just part of the SEC Nation crew. We're talking about him and the Jaguars way more than we would have. The Jaguars are somewhat interesting for the first time, and I don't know how long. All right. Well, if you want to, if you want to weigh in on DeChambeau, Kepka, Tebow, or otherwise, we'll do it. We're going to talk a little bit about Aaron Rodgers as well before we get into the Nashville Predators. Cam, I see you on the line. Hang with us. We're coming right back. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. More Titans talk than anyone else. What a catch! You're-
Titans in Falls Football. 1045 The Zone. WGFX Gallatin Nashville. A cumulus station. Trending now at 1045 The Zone. It is 12.03. Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Panzeca. The Nashville Predators are back in Raleigh tonight for Game 5 in the best of seven series against the Carolina Hurricanes with the series tied up at two after a pair of double OT wins by the Preds in Bridgestone over the weekend. Don't miss pre- and post-game coverage with myself and Alex Doherty on 104.5 The Zone TV and A to Z Sports. We go live at 6.40 for a 7 p.m. puck drop. Also, Bridgestone Arena announcing earlier today capacity will be increased when they return to Nashville to over 14,000 fans. Julio Jones went on FS1's Undisputed yesterday, answering a phone call by Shannon Sharp, possibly not knowing he was on the air and saying, quote, I'm out of there when asked if he was staying in Atlanta. Jones also denied any rumors he will sign with the Cowboys, saying right now I just want to win. The Falcons also announced the signing of former Titans wide receiver Tajay Sharp yesterday. Falcons head coach Arthur Smith spoke to the media this morning and refused to comment, calling Julio Jones rumors to Dallas irrelevant. Chris Sims of PFT also reporting earlier today on PFT Live that Jones reportedly is down to the Patriots and the Titans as his preferred landing spots. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Balls. This is 104.5 The Zone. He's been the best Titans reporter in town, so of course we had to get ourselves... What DeShambo said was keep it on the line because Kepka's putting was horrible. I watched the tournament all day Sunday. Couldn't miss Phil winning at 50, but that's what pissed him off so bad. Hey, Cam, I appreciate you waiting to tell us that because we weren't, we weren't sure. I couldn't make it out from the video. I just heard I – don't, I don't know if you saw it go uh, viral on the internet yesterday, but I just heard uh, the, the – uh, expletives that, that yeah. Kepka was spitting at him. We had another caller chime in earlier. He didn't want to be on the air who said the exact same thing that Cam just told us. Well, thank you for making us smarter, Cam. We appreciate the call. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in. All right. So now we know what Brooks Kepka or what DeChambeau did to Brooks Kepka. And Brand- Brandon Williams is time to I don't I don't see this is a problem, Lucas. I don't want to say this every time We get a bunch of comments, but do I need to say it every time? Because people ask enough, like when, if you can't hear the audio on 104.5 The Zone TV, it's because we don't own the rights to the music. So we can't have it on the live stream until the music is done behind me. We got to figure out a way to do something about that. Because that's, you know, I know that's above your pay grade and I'm not, I'm not putting it. Get right on that, Buck. (laughs) I, I just, you know, why? This is not, this is probably something that should be safe for not when I'm not in front of a microphone, but it's too late. <laughs> We're here now. What are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing with this? Like, why even bother? Like, if they can't hear the first, they can't hear the first minute of the Zone TV thing, like, why is it even on? <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm sorry. I, I know this. There are many people who are, and listen, 
Will Bowling has worked very hard on this. Paul Mason has worked very hard on this. Lucas and all of the producers work very hard to make this thing go. And I know it's only like, what, 20 minutes or 20 seconds that, that people can't hear. <laughs> but it's the very start. It drives me crazy. We got to be able to do something about that. All right. Namaste. <laughs> I'll take it up with somebody later. Uh, Aaron Rodgers. It's called DCMA, says Schizo Penguin. What, what a name, Schizo Penguin. <laughs> the name, one of these names in the Twitch chat is going to get me in trouble, honestly. Uh, what, what is DCMA, Lucas? Look it up. Maybe not on a work computer just to be safe. I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Defense Contract Management Agency. Defense Contract Management Agency? That sounds like a, like a, federal, like a federal bureau. Do we have any idea what that is? I'm putting no. you. I'm putting you on the spot. All right, I'll talk about Aaron Rodgers. You, you see if you can't do some research. Say, see if we can't lobby the DCMA uh, or DMCA. Penguin corrects himself. The DC, the et, damn it, <laughs> DMCA. Uh, see if we can't lobby them for just, just the, just the open, just the bump music to start the show. So I don't have to do this ah, every time. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Oh! A 1998 <laughs> United States copyright law that implements two 1996 treaties of the World Intellectual Property Organization. Well, they could go to hell. <laughs> that answers, answers nothing. No, no, I mean, we get it. Brandon says, I just need 100% of the content in my veins, Buck. Yeah, I know. We're trying. We're trying. But uh, we are fighting against the DMCA. So we will take it up with them. We'll see if we can't get a representative in the DMCA on the radio so I can yell at them about the 20 seconds of music that I can't play. Anyway, what's happening with we Aaron Rodgers? We have a Rod playlist. What? We have a playlist. Okay. It's on Spotify. It's the Buck Rising Show. Lucas works very hard to put it together because we don't copycat J. Mark Ramon. We don't do the celebrity playlist. That's their thing. But Lucas has great taste in music. And so if you are jonesing for additional Buck Rising Show content, Lucas has a playlist of all of the music played on the show in the Spotify app. So go check it out. Throw it a like and, uh, and make suggestions because apparently he's a jukebox back there. So you can ask for songs if you want to hear songs. Uh, <laughs> Rocky Top Twiz says he Googled DCMA. I mean, what else is he supposed to do? This, half of Lucas's job, maybe not half, but like one-tenth of the things that I ask Lucas to do over the course of what, the five hours that we spend together every just day? Google things. Just Google things. Hey. <laughs> Let me let me yap for a minute. Go Google it. Because <laughs> I'm not capable of Googling and talking at the same time. I'm one of these people who's got to, like, speak out what I'm typing or talk out what I'm typing. Maybe that's just because I'm getting old and my brain is fried at this point. But anyway. Aaron Rodgers. Are people sick of him? Whose side are people on? The Green Bay Packers or Aaron Rodgers? Because he made a public appearance. I don't know if it's his first public appearance. Since Adam Schefter broke the news of him wanting out in Green Bay. I think it's his first interview because he was at the Kentucky Derby. He's been out. Right. And they interviewed him at the Kentucky Derby, but they didn't ask him about this whole situation, which, you know, what, whatever. But he was dressed like a, like a James Bond villain at the <laughs> Kentucky Derby, by the way. Like he, was, he looked like he was out there to foil whatever, whatever uh, plan yeah, Tom Brady and to, had in place. And Tom Brady was there to catch him. Or the other way around. Yeah, you know, one way or the other. Tom Brady with the Tom Brady with the uh, with the what do you call them, the Smokey the Bear hats that that all the basic white women in Nashville wear. Anyway, let's hear from Aaron Rodgers on Sports Center last night, and then pe people can decide whose side that they are on. Do you find it strange that the people have been sort of conditioned to believe management is always right, like like the players a bad guy because he stands up for himself. Management must be right because. The loyalty to the team is paramount. And then someone like you, others, Richard Sherman, have kind of voiced that opinion like, hey, I, I'm, a, I'm a worker. I work for myself and my family, so I'm going to stick up for myself in whatever situation it is. God, that was a serious question. <laughs> that was a good question. You know, I think, I think sometimes people forget uh, what really makes an organization. And, uh, you know, history is important, uh, you know, legacy of so many uh, people who've come before you, but the people, that's the most important thing. The people make an organization, people make a business. Um, and sometimes uh, that gets forgotten. You know, culture is built brick by brick, 
the foundation of it by the people, you know, not by the, not by the organization, not by the building, not by the, the corporation. It's built by the people. And I've been fortunate enough to play with a number of amazing, amazing people and got to work for some amazing people as well. And it's those people that build the foundation of those entities. And I think sometimes we forget that, you know. Uh, Are you demanding with my, a trade? With, yeah, with my situation, look, it's it's never been about, uh, you know, never been about the draft pick, uh, picking Jordan. I love Jordan. He's a great kid. Um, you know, he, he a lot of fun to, to work together. Uh, I love coaching staff, love my teammates, you know, love the fan base in Green Bay. It's incredible, incredible 16 years. It's just kind of about a, a, a philosophy, you know, and, and maybe forgetting that it is about the people that make the thing go. It's about, it's about character. It's about culture. It's about doing things the right way. And a lot of this was put in motion last year, and uh, the wrench was just kind of thrown into it when I won MVP and played uh, the way I played last year. So this is just kind of, I think, uh, the, the spill out of all that. But, look, man, it is about the people, and that's the most important thing. Green Bay has always been about the people, from Curly Lambeau, uh, being owner and founder to the 60s with Lombardi and Bart Starr and all those incredible names to the 90s teams with Coach Holmgren and Farvey and the Minister of Defense to the, the run that we've been on. It's about it's about the people. It's Aaron Rodgers on Sports Center last night for Kenny Maine's last Sports Center, which made me very sad because Kenny Maine's an absolute stud, icon in the industry. Um you know, I know ESP, all, all major television networks are, are cutting costs right now, but the way that they kind of, I mean, they let they let Kenny Mayne finish it out it with, with grace, at least, but it's a shame that he can't stay on SportsCenter anymore. Anyway, whose side are you on? Aaron Rodgers of the Packers. I'll tell you whose side you're going to be on tonight. It's going to be the Nashville Predators. Everybody's going to try to figure out, or we're all trying to figure out, if they're going to be able to do what they did the last two games here in Nashville if it's going to travel to Raleigh for game five tonight. We'll talk about it with Alex Doherty on the other side. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. Coming up today on the 3HL. Jim Wyatt joins us to talk about the...
Barkley Stout. Back-to-back double overtime performances. So we bring in Alex Doherty of A to Z Sports Nashville, who has been covering the Preds for some time and has been doing it exceptionally well and also will be on the post-game and pre-game coverage tonight on A to Z Sports and 104.5 The Zone's streaming platforms. Hey, buddy, how are we? What's going on, Buck? I, I tell you what, you know what you don't have to worry about tonight is th- tonight's game ending in a tie. You will not see that tonight. <laughs> Wait, yeah, just help me understand this because you have to deal with a particular, like hockey Twitter seems to be sensitive, at least based on my dealings with them. What I saw yesterday from soccer, oh, yeah. what, what I saw yesterday from soccer Twitter honestly blew me away. Maybe because it's my first interaction <laughs> with them, but what the hell? I, you know, I, I think it's it's early in the uh, in the franchise's fan base. Now, look, Lucas and and all the guys that do the soccer shows, they they can tell you a lot more about the fan base. I only know a very little about uh, a little about it, but it does a little bit remind me of early on with the Predators fan base, and I'm talking early, early, like you know, late '90s, early 2000s, where it was just people people were just trying to get the word out that like, hey, this team is here, and they're and they're you know they're they're fun to watch. Go to these games. It reminds me a little bit of that. However, you have the added bonus of having social media. So you've got, you didn't have that in 1999. You just, you know, you could just talk to your friends about it. But now you've got social media everywhere. So you have people maybe lashing out in a way that they they wouldn't otherwise. I, I mean, I guess it's just, you know, listen, I, I, cover, I cover the Titans. I cover the NFL. These people don't get any lack of attention. So... I mean, they are, they are, you know, crazed as any sports fan base on social media is. But just my experiences with hockey Twitter and soccer Twitter the past couple of weeks, because I've had my fair share with the radio show, I have been, uh, I have really, I can't, I can't say that I've enjoyed them necessarily, but I have been taken aback by them, uh, to be sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think, I think again, I think it's social media just being being what it is. I, I, I think uh, in ho- hockey, in the hockey world in particular, what I've noticed is, is you can be simultaneously uh, just as as homerism as as possible, but also completely against your team in every way, according to the. And, and people can read that in the same tweet. You can make one tweet that uh, people will read simultaneously uh, as the most homeristic take possible and also uh hey stick up for the home team why don't you you know it, it's it's pretty ridiculous so sometimes you just have to ignore it but you know you you know all about that <laughs> no i don't do a good job of ignoring it but that's okay that's <laughs> that's why i'm here that's all right uh alex doherty of a to z sports here with us on 104.5 the zone all right what what can we expect can the they they've had to do so much heavy lifting alex in these last two games They've played over a full regulation NHL game just in overtimes alone at this point. Are they going to be able to travel the magic that they have seemed to find in Bridgestone Arena as well as exceptional play from the new Forsberg, Duchesne, and Johansson line and everything that UC Soros has done? Does the Preds game travel? Well, you know, so far it hasn't in Carolina this year. They have not beaten the Carolina Hurricanes in in Carolina this year. But I think I, I think there's something a little bit different about having a two game win streak in the playoffs going into their building, especially the way that it happened. Two just you know very dramatic <clears throat> um, victories for the home team in Nashville. And you know, if you're Carolina, they they have. I would say that they have probably thrown everything that they have at Nashville at this point. So it's not like they have some, some other configuration that they've been waiting to use in the same way that Nashville threw out this Duchesne Johansson Forsberg line to, to, to change it up. Right. They're not going to go out there and say, okay, now we're going to put Sebastian Ajo with Brock McGinn. And now we're going to put, you know, Jordan Stahl on the top line with Svechnikov. They're, they're going to roll with what they have. Like they're not going to change up anything, at least in my opinion. Um, and so that, in that respect, I think maybe Nashville has the edge. Carolina still has the edge in overall talent. I don't think there's any question. I mean, they, they right. still have a better defense. They still, you know, top to bottom, they still have better forwards top to bottom. I think Nashville has the edge in goal, but it's really actually pretty close. I mean, Nadelkovich and UC Soros in terms of just save percentage are almost identical. 
so, and they've both played really well. So um, I think Carolina still has the edge in, in talent, but, but Nashville has this sort of, they've thrown this new, new wrinkle at them. And I don't know if Carolina is necessarily going to be able to match it and, and change up to, to counter what Nashville's doing. What did you make of the uh, What did you make of the Hurricanes coach complaining about you know basically fighting against the officials here in Nashville? I know that I think that was after Game Three as opposed to Game Four, if I'm not uh-huh. mistaken. But what What did you take away from that? Is, is, is does, does he have any ground to stand on with that kind of claim? Uh, I, I think he sounded exactly like a former player. Uh, sticking up for his current players and showing that he's got their back. That's what it sounded like to me. Uh, I mean, Rod Brindamore, you know, such a legendary player for the Hurricanes for so many years, won a cup there as a player. I think he just he's – a, he's a player's coach, and I think that's why they love him so much. Uh, John Hines, you know, by comparison, very different. You know, obviously he came out and said, like, you know, we're not worried about that. We're just worried about winning the game. And even today, at his media availability, said – uh, you know, he, he did see that and, and, you know, there were some calls that kind of could have gone either way, but he didn't think that it affected the game and uh, very diplomatic of, of John Hines. So, uh, you know, Rod Brindamore would make for a really good, uh, really good midday sports radio talk show host. And maybe John Hines wouldn't uh, in that respect, but uh, I don't think, I don't think Rod Brindamore has a really big case here because as Hines pointed out, I, I Several of the penalties were just like easy calls. I yeah. mean, it was pucks over the over the glass for delay of game. It was hooks when the guy gained an advantage on you. It was interference calls way away from the play. It wasn't like you know a, a ton of subjectivity here. So I, I don't think he had a case, and I thought it was I thought it was just he sounded like a player out there. He sounded like you know honestly he sounded like Mike Vrabel. You know, but Mike Vrabel goes out there and sticks up for his players. You know, just as a former player, very similar in, in the way he coaches. <laughs> Uh, Alex Doherty of A to Z Sports here with us on 104.5 The Zone. We're talking Preds and Canes. Game five taking place in Raleigh tonight. Um, with with the situation for the Preds, understanding that they are probably, and, and I probably is not the right word, that they are still the inferior team talent-wise, but have found ways to gut it out these last two games. I've still been shocked over the, or at least since game four, to see that Carolina has been almost as inept on the power play as the Nashville Predators <clears> have, <throat> is there something to be exploited there with the Predator uh, with the Predators penalty kill to be able to take advantage of what Carolina has been missing? Well, you know, I, I've said this several times now. I feel like, honestly, in the playoffs, I, I actually did some work. research on this uh, a few years back. I'll have, to, I'll have to go back and look at that, but. In the playoffs, what you so often see is that power plays tend to either stay the same or get worse, and and penalty kills usually get better because players are more desperate. There's a lot more. You, you, they're, they're they're quicker with their sticks. They're they're desperate to get the puck out. Uh, it's easier to you know just get a get a stick on a puck and get it out of the zone than it is to score uh, on the power play. So I think that there's partly that's what's happening that the the Predators' penalty kill has really stepped it up. I mean, Mikhail Granlin, Colton Sissons, Eric Halla, those forwards, Cal Yarncroke, of course, uh, all play great minutes on the penalty kill. I, I think Ryan Ellis is, is probably stands out as probably the best penalty killer at this point. He's, a, he's had like four or five blocks that have just been crazy, including one with the back of his head. Um, and uh, so they, they've just been the, – the, the Predators' penalty kill has been up to the task. The, the – thing that you don't want is you don't want to give them too many chances to fail. And uh, if they go in and get Carolina a, a couple power play chances in the first period and they get a goal or two, boy, it's going to be tough to come out of that building with a win, just like they saw in games one and two. We're going to play you some John Hines audio because he was asked about what it's been like to play in Bridgestone Arena and now going back to the opposing team's barn, for lack of a better term. Here was Hines with the media earlier this week. Well, I think that it's it, it it is a benefit for us that we've actually been here, you know, with with uh, with the first two games, and it is a factor in this series. You know, when you look at what's going on in Bridgestone, is unbelievable, and and here, I mean, there's a lot of fans. It's loud. It, you know, teams get energy from it. Uh, but like this is the best. Like this is the best part. You're coming in Game Five on the road. We haven't won a game here. If you if, if you're going to give yourself a chance to win the series, like this is the best thing. Like you're coming in. Uh, it's a big game. 
there's going to be a raucous crowd. And, and this is what we talk about even within our room. Like it's, it's, it's digging in, having some toughness, sticking together. Like these are the times where you really have to be able to play, not with each other. You got to be able to play for each other and a uh, great challenge for us. Excited. And uh, you know, it's something that uh, this time of year is, and, and the benefits that we have fans in the stands now, it just makes it that much more exciting and, uh, and, 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 and competitive. So we're looking forward to You've, you've, that was John Hines talking to the media earlier today. Alex tweeted that out at Alex Doherty one is where you can follow him. Uh, we, I, you've been at these games. I have not been to Bridgestone arena in front of a packed house in a long time. It feels like I, this was, I think literally the month that the pandemic shut everything down was the last time I was in Bridgestone arena for any kind of hockey game, much less a playoff game. H- has it had a substantial impact on them to be able to play in front of what was what was said to be twelve thousand fans the other night? It looked like a little more, to be honest. Yeah, it definitely looked like more to me. I, um, yeah, that was. I asked John about that today, and, and so I think in his response, you can tell that he doesn't want his players to think too much that the crowd is what won them the game. You know, and and I, I, I in their hearts, they know that they, they know that they're you know they're the ones that, that put the performance on the ice and got two double overtime wins at the same time. I, I mean, anyone who watched those games knows that what the deeper that those games got that, you know, when they crossed the 80 minutes of playtime and 90 minutes of playtime, the, the crowd is such an important part of that because they don't go away. They, they, the crowd's not getting tired. You know, they're, they're nervous, but they're not getting tired and they're, they're trying to amp their team into getting it. And lo and behold, they got two victories that way. It's, it's impossible to not, you know, it's impossible to ignore. And so I think what I was trying to ask him uh, there was like, you know, how, how much, how important is it, or maybe how difficult is it to switch from, you know, engaging with and fu- being fueled by that home crowd to, to going on the road and having to shut it all out. Right. I mean, you're going to have fans that, that hate you, uh, to, to however many fans they have, they're all going to hate you and you're going to change your, your sort of mindset there. Um, and you know what, John Hines is, he, he said it best. I think, you know, they got to play for each other and not with each other. They got to play, they got to look at their line mates, know that they have to do everything they can to make them better on the ice, uh, to try to give them another chance to clinch a home series, I'm sorry, clinch a playoff series at home, which is honestly unthinkable where we were a week ago. <laughs> Without question. Uh, gut, gut feeling, Alex Doherty, do they win tonight? Well, I, I predicted the Preds to win in six, so I, I have to stick with that. I have to go with my, my original prediction of Preds in six, so I think my gut feeling tells me that they win tonight, and I wouldn't be surprised if they win big. There was a game five in Winnipeg a few years ago. I remember they uh, – um, I think it was in Winnipeg. Now I'm, now I'm getting my years mixed up maybe. There was a game five recently that they went on the road and just do- dominated the team. It might have been a game six, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but the Preds have had some pretty bad game fives in their history. There have been some pretty pretty awful performances and some uh, really dramatic losses, the biggest of which being back in 2010 against the Chicago Blackhawks. Game five has not been kind to the Predators. But I think that given what I said earlier about how they've changed things up and they have a, they threw this curveball at Carolina that so far Carolina has not been able to, to hit, and I think that's a bigger factor here. And then they still have UC Soros. They still got a really balanced D, D core that they can put out there. I, I, I like their chances. I think that they, uh, they could get the win tonight. Alex, how much do you think this was in John Hines' back pocket in terms of the curveball you're talking about with Duchesne joining that top yeah. line with Forsberg and Johansson? Is that something do you think he kind of had finger on the trigger ready to go? Because we saw it in the regular season finale. You didn't think we'd really see it before the series. And then it happens pretty quickly after two games. Yeah, I actually was thinking about that um, today and, and over the weekend. It, it is interesting, right? Because it's like, if he knew this was there, if, if he did have it in his back pocket, why didn't he use it earlier in the season when they were so bad? Um, the other thing is, I, the reason I don't think he did have it in his back pocket is because his use of Matt Duchesne, I think he was really trying to grow his two-way game into, into being a little bit better, playing with guys like Nick Cousins and Brad Richardson and Gally Yonkroke playing really a two-way game most of the season. Um, it, it was probably very frustrating for Matthew Shane. In fact, you saw some times when 
Duchesne got benched in, in a game for stretches of to- stretches at a time because of a bad defensive play. So maybe he was just trying to grow his defensive game, but I, at some point you had to realize, okay, we've got to unlock this guy's offensive potential at the risk of being a defensive liability, which, by the way, I don't think that he is. I, I think Matt Duchesne defensively is just fine. He's, a, he's got the speed to keep up with anyone. Um, yeah, it is interesting, right? I mean, like, if that is what John Hines did, keep it in his back pocket, man, 4D chess from, from John Hines. Really kind of a, a, a veteran coaching move that I, I did not see coming. So it's interesting to think about. He is Alex Doherty of A to Z Sports. You can watch him tonight on the pregame show and the postgame show on A to Z Sports and 104.5 The Zone. You can read him at A to Z Sports Nashville.com. Buddy, thank you. Enjoy the hockey tonight. Absolutely. We'll see you guys later. All right. We will. Uh, hmm. I don't know how I feel about him tonight. I don't know. We don't do game predictions which is, you know, something that I utterly detest but is like a staple of lazy sports talk radio. But I I, I legitimately can't get a read on it, especially like how drastic a difference it looked from one and two to three and four for me to have any kind of sense of this game or this team. Honestly, (laughs) outside of the goaltender, I, I just don't know what to make of it. Yeah, it was really hard to find a difference between the two on Friday and Sunday when you're going l- not just double overtime, like late in double overtime, scoring the winner with five minutes to go or four minutes to go. And the crowd did make a huge difference at Bridgestone. So I wonder if it was a big enough difference that going back to Carolina, we see a bit of a drop off. You know, even, even if they, even if they let this one slip tonight, because now they're at the point where they're going to have to win two, uh, what, two of three. Yeah. To be able to get the series at this point. I I just I just can't get myself this is this is going to be terrible to say out loud I can't get myself to buy into them. Is that wrong? I mean it's hard to fathom them winning in 6 which would mean winning 4 in a row against this team. That's hard to even manufacture in your mind of that happening. I, I don't see that. If they win I think it's got to be in 7. Our buddy Garrett Hargis uh, from Bussin' with the Boys, by the way, Will Compton, and and I think his co-host may be on tomorrow. They had a big guest uh, that the podcast will drop tomorrow, but Garrett Hargis uh, from Bussin' with the Boys has tweeted us, Buck Rising just hates hockey. I don't. I don't. I just don't know how I feel about this team. I want them to win because I want to keep talking about it, and I want to continue to have a team, a local team, in playoff contention because that, listen, it's good for me. But uh, you know the level of uh, the the whole the whole belief thing. It's not really something that I do. <laughs> <laughs> there was some great hockey last night. Great oh, hockey! Oh, really? I, I haven't I haven't been watching the series. I, I caught a little bit of the Tampa Bay Florida series a, just in general because yeah. those games have been fun. No, that's been electric. There was a triple yeah. overtime yesterday as the Jets sweep the Oilers. Islanders beat the Pens in double overtime on a goaltending error. Oh, really? Yeah, it was brutal. Brutal. Jesus. <laughs> and, like, re- remembering what the Preds went through over the weekend, I can't fathom losing in double OT on just a giveaway by the goaltender. Oh. That's what happened to the Penguins. <laughs> now pe- now people are leaning in because I've said that out loud. Too, he says, why does Buck Rising hate hockey? No, I hate all of you. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. Getting you set for Titans training camp. Bam! You're home for Titans.
because every time Rhett Bryan comes on the air, he's incredibly polished, incredibly professional. I want the audience to know the Rhett Bryan that I know. Not this, not this man who comes in here. He's very, very cordial, very, very polite. No, no, no. Fraud. <laughs> That's not all, Rhett Brian. That's not that. No, you guys know Rhett Brian. I know Root Brian. <laughs> um, do the polls here in a second. Can I? I've, I've complained about a lot of things today. <laughs> picture day. Picture day put me in a bad mood, and it all spiraled downhill from there. But we had a fun show, and if you missed any of it, the Buck Rising Show on your favorite podcast app. Also, new six one five sessions podcast out today. Me and my buddy Adam Vingan from the Athletic. You want more Preds talk before Game 5 takes place tonight, you can subscribe, rate, and review to the 615 Sessions podcast in the A to Z Sports podcast feed. I do it for the people every Tuesday because I'm not talking enough. But I got a DM. Well, I've gotten several DMs, but I got a DM specifically yesterday that I don't want to say it bothered me, but I don't know how I feel about it, Lucas. So maybe you can you can tell me if I'm being a jerk or not. So I won't use names because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but this person, and it's not the first time something like this has happened to me, but this person DM me and said, hey, how about you give a fan a follow? My 104.5 conquest is almost complete. Just need you, Blaine, and Mickey. And listen, I, I don't want to sound because I'm going to sound like a jerk. I, I don't want to sound like a jerk. I don't mean to sound like a jerk. Like it's a very flattering position that I get to be in where I have people who enjoy the show or we have people who enjoy the show because we work very hard on this show. Lucas, myself, everybody who gives their time and their effort will bowling for as much as uh, for as hard a time as I give them. Everybody does a great job to put this show together. I'm just the I'm just the idiot in front of the microphone. Um, But I hate when people ask me to follow them on Twitter. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it so much. Now, uh, but I'm willing I'm willing to have somebody earn the opportunity, right? So I said, "Okay, what's your pitch?" Like I'm not you know, listen, I I cuz I went and went to see went and saw who like already follows this guy. And it's Ramon and it's Jason and it's uh Dawn and Brent and Slay, and that's fine if they want to just give their follows out. Like that's cool. And I'm not somebody I'm not any kind of important that my follow means something. But also, like if I'm going to put you on my timeline, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. My Twitter is very specifically tailored to just give me an NFL data download and sometimes make me laugh with stupid videos on the internet. Um, so if you do any of those things, I'm open for business. But you got to pitch me. And the pitch can't be because I asked, hey, you know, all right, go ahead. Sell me. Why should I follow you? And the response was, well, to have my favorite radio station hosts follow me on my favorite station. And that's fine, but that's not a pitch. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You guys sell me harder than that. Has that ever happened to you? I hate that. I, I, I just, something about that bothers me in a way that it shouldn't because it's very flattering and I should probably not be a jerk and I sound like a jerk at this point. Yeah, what do, what do you need him to do to, to bestow the great honor of a follow from Buck Rising? <laughs> Dance for me, clown. <laughs> that's not what I, that's what I'm trying to avoid, okay? Like, do you do, do are, are you somebody who produces funny content on the internet? Okay. Like, I'm down. I, it's, Twitter is my news feed, so if you're not doing news, it's got to be something that I can get something out of. You know what I'm saying? Because, um, like, there's very few people that aren't in, like, it's, it's very business-related, my Twitter feed, at least, uh, what I'm saying. And, like, the exceptions are, like, V-Love and Buckethead. You know what I'm saying? Like, people who make me laugh. So if you make me laugh, I'll follow you on Twitter. <laughs> Bo Daddy, oh, just a knife in my side. Says on Twitch, I mean, you don't even have the blue verified check mark. Lucas, just give me the damn polls. Let me get out of here. <laughs> All right, then. I reckon I'll talk about a poll update. Mm. This is Carl Childers. There's a young feller. Mm. I think he's got the final numbers. Here's the producer of the Buck Rising Show. Mm. A feller named Lucas Panzeker. Got any mustard and biscuits? <laughs> Rhett Bryan is Sling Blade. That might be, I, that honestly, I think it's a little bit of a reach, but that might be my favorite one. I, I'm still on the Godfather one. Okay, well, that's. Uh, but there are several. Sure. Will Julio Jones play for the Titans in 2021? Nearly 700 votes. 63% say yes against 37% saying no. 
Uh, if you're asking me, like, you know, I don't have any information on this right now. Last I checked in on it, they weren't talking about it internally. But if you ask me if it's the Titans or the field to get Julio Jones, I'm taking the field. Like, the, there's just a lot of hoops that they're going to jump through. I don't think it's impossible, and I think it makes a lot of sense. And it also helps that he seems to want to be here, according yeah. to Chris Sims. Chris Sims reporting Titans and Pats are his preferred destinations. Do the Preds win tonight? 58% are saying yes. Homers. <laughs> But no, listen, they, if, if they can, momentum in sports is not quantifiable. It's one of the most frustrating things to kind of analyze. But if they can find a way for the changes that they've made through these four games to travel, then they are going to be successful. Now, it took double overtime in both of these games for them to be able to get one, well, I guess get two over Carolina. But uh, I just, I, I don't, I don't believe the way that the rest of you believe. And that's not, I don't. It's not because I dislike the Predators. I'm just looking at this objectively. And uh, the Preds don't, they're not better to me. They're just not. Are you comfortable posing for pictures? 73% say no. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> Picture day was terrible today. I, I hate posing. Don't ask me to, you know, don't ask me to cross my arms. Don't ask me to stick my thumbs in my pockets. Uh, and I, again, Allie did a great job, so I'm not mad at Allie. I just hate that. <laughs> Which side are you on, Aaron Rodgers or the Packers? 71% say Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. No, always labor over management, as far as I'm concerned. Got to unionize. Do you hate anything the way Brooks Kepka hates Bryson DeChambeau? 57% say no. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, just to hear the sound of him walking behind him to bring such a reaction, that's a, that's a level of hate. That is difficult to attain. Connor but, says the Colts. Nashville Betts says the University of Florida. Davey Shepard, our friend, says so many things. <laughs> I'll tell you the one thing that I hate as much as Brooks Kepka hates Bryson DeChambeau. I hate picture day. But it's okay because it's over, as is this show. Blaine and Mickey, they will do it without a great deal of hate. Coming up next. So, chatting Titans? Well, it's our favorite pastime. Your home for Titans football and the flagship of Titans Radio, 104.5 The Zone. All right, it's playoff time. Big stakes, bigger promotions. DraftKings Sportsbook is putting you courtside with a chance to turn $5 into 200 That's 40 to 1 odds on any basketball game. All you have to do is pick any team that is still in the hunt for the trophy, and if that team wins, you will receive $200 in free credits. All it takes to claim these 40 to 1 odds on the basketball team of your choosing is placing a $5 bet on that team and that team winning. So download the top rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the promo code WGFX when you sign up to turn $5 into $200 in free credits. Bet on the basketball team of your choice to win their next game. And if they do, you can claim $200 in free credits. That's promo code WGFX for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 years or older and present in Tennessee to bet. Wager paid out in site credits. Uh, restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call or text the Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789. 